For that, I think we've laid out seven uh, fairly important, um, not always easy to achieve uh, changes in the way we do church. And if we can get there, I think the, 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 entire, the entire complexion, the entire uh, understanding of the church will be changed in our days. And with that, um, maybe the church will no longer be a laughing stock. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton. And on today's episode, we're wrapping up our discussion on uh, the Reformation, on this uh, modern Reformation that we are uh, talking about that, um, honestly, Ken, we've been talking about this the past couple of years uh, as uh, as really this message was was just really being birthed in your heart. Um, I want to say 2020, 2021 um, is when we really began talking about it and you began carrying it, but we're, we're coming here to the conclusion, the final two points that Mark, um, whatever we're calling this, uh, <laughs> this modern reformation, this, this needed reformation, whatever it is, but there, there, I don't think there's a question in anyone's mind that something has to change, uh, in, in how we do church and how leadership, uh, runs the church in the West. And I think, you know, to, to quote, um, you know, to quote, uh, Lonnie Frisbee, uh, I believe God wants his church back and he has, uh, he has ways that he wants to do things. And and so much of those are found in scripture. And I was just thinking, Ken, uh, the last episode that we did, just how much a, a reading of Timothy and Titus uh, would have helped sort a lot of that stuff out that, that Paul talks about so long ago and what's required in, in leading a church and what's required and how to, you know, itching ears and uh, fidelity to, to one wife and, you know, all of those sort of things that we, uh, we, we touched on, but how important those, those scriptures are uh, to where we're at now. So Ken, thanks for joining us and, uh, and thanks for leading us in this discussion. Yeah. Well, um, so we're going to do our last two points of the seven. And by the way, there could be more. Remember Luther had 95 points that he wanted to address. Um, and we could definitely lengthen this, but I, I've tried to stay to what I think are the maybe the most critical um, for our time. So far in the last two episodes, uh, we've covered heartfelt spirituality, the foundation of the Bible, um, financial excess, uh, sexual excess, um, remaining consistent with historic Christianity. Those were our first five um, kind of big banner headline type issues. The sixth just- issue... Just to speak into that, if you're just picking this up, we're against both financial excess and sexual excess. The other <laughs> the other points were like we're they're pro points, but those were against uh, points. That's so, right. But, yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, the sixth point is the priesthood of all believers. Now, this was something Luther fought for. I would say vigorously. Um, he probably actually didn't go far enough. And it's because in his own mind, he was constrained, you know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He was constrained um, by his understanding initially of just what is the priesthood, because he had been a Roman Catholic priest until he was excommunicated and, uh, and by extension defrocked and became the founder of the Lutheran church movement. So he, he still had, I think, deep in his mind, the idea that some are more equal than others. And so while there is the priesthood of all believers, um, and Luther was uh, initially a priest, later a Lutheran pastor, and he believed that everybody was somehow um, a priest, I don't think Luther was particularly comfortable with the idea of just anybody, say, ordaining themselves, or just anybody... Um, performing marriage rites. In fact, in, in his time, uh, marriage was very much a union of, no pun intended, uh, a union of churchly function and the function of the state. And so the church functioned on behalf of the state to solemnize marriages. Uh, but, but the idea that the church would perform a marriage independent of the state probably never crossed Luther's mind. And so this is part of why in that era, 
the Reformation, those guys that were leading the Reformation, so Luther, uh, Calvin, Zwingli, um, John Knox up in Scotland, um, there were others as well. I'm just naming some of the more obvious and visible leaders. Um, these people become known as the magisterial reformers because they are part of the magisterium. They're part of the ruling class. And so church and state are still at this time very tightly linked together. And that goes right back to the time that Constantine legitimized Christianity. So this priesthood of all believers, um, I'll tell you where we really see it break down. There was a, there was a time during Luther's life where a group of German believers um, in the region of Zwickau, which was a, a town uh, and, and a district, um, they believed that they had received the spirit of prophecy. And they began prophesying, um, I would say, with great enthusiasm, which is to say it was vigorous, it was forceful, it was loud, it was many things. Um, and Luther didn't like it at all. And he certainly didn't believe in the modern gift of prophecy. He didn't, he didn't see that at all. And so what he ends up doing as a cleric is encouraging the, the civil government, civic government. He, he encourages them to slaughter the Zwickau prophets. And so there is a great uh, letting of blood that goes on in and around Zwickau and all the Zwickau prophets are killed. And this is a reason, the reason that these guys arose, the Zwickau prophets, is because of the Anabaptist movement. Well, the Anabaptists, Anna is, is um, a Greek word that means re. So the re-Baptist movement, which is to say, there were many people who were coming to salvation by faith through grace, who had not been born again under the old system that included infant baptism and the sacraments. Uh, they were just going through the religious motions, but now they heard Luther's message and they were, they were now genuinely saved and they wanted to be, they wanted to be part of that. Well, what do you do when you get saved? You seek baptism. And so a lot of people who had been baptized as infants Remember what I said about the theology of why you needed to baptize infants, lest they go to hell. A lot of people who've been baptized as infants, they wanted to be re-baptized as, as the Catholic Church viewed it and as Luther himself viewed it. And so for those who wanted to be re-baptized, and there are a number of um, uh, sects and movements that come out of that period that are still with us today. The Amish, the Mennonites, the Hutterites, um, all of them are Anabaptist type movements. Uh, they believe only in believer baptism. Um, the Baptist denomination in the United States is a derivative of all of this. And many of the um, other movements that are straight line believer baptism type movements, for example, the Nazarenes. Now, the Nazarenes, just to be clear, they emerged in the 20th century. They are like 400 years later than the magisterial reformation but but there are a lot of these kinds of groups around even today that say you know baptism is for believers we don't baptize babies it does a baby no good they don't express any faith and we don't believe in the sacramental power to rescue an infant from the from hell um if we baptize him so out of that anabaptist movement luther says well look if they want to be baptized put them all the way under and so many of them died death by drowning as they tried to put down this movement that emerged, that erupted, it was an unintended consequence, I think is the way we would say it today, of Luther's preaching on Reformation and the priesthood of all believers. And guess what? Some of the people who were doing those baptisms, they were doing them one to another. This wasn't, you know, they got a local pastor to, to re-baptize them even. It was, hey, Bill, can you baptize me? Sure, John, because, you know, we both come into this new belief about salvation by faith uh, and by faith alone. And so absolutely, I'll baptize you and you baptize me. And Luther was like, absolutely not. We're not going there. So what do we mean by the priesthood of all believers? Well, I think there is order in the church. And I think it is it is clearly in scripture um, that those who are somehow leaders in the church, maybe not necessarily pastors, but leaders in the church, 
are the ones who typically administer various sacraments. So for baptism, we see Ananias baptizing St. Paul. We don't know exactly who Ananias was. Um, Hippolytus in the Apostolic Constitutions and Eusebius in the Ecclesiastical History, they mention uh, this man, Ananias, and they say that he's one of the uh, 72 apostles that Jesus sent out after the 12 apostles, and they are called apostles uh, in their writings. Now, they're writing roughly 150 to 200 years later than the events themselves, but there was a fairly strong oral tradition that kept this idea alive. Could it have been corrupted along the way? Yeah, it could have happened. But I think most historians believe that Eusebius and, and Hippolytus probably had things uh, about as close as we're going to get them, absent the discovery of some documentation legitimizing um, you know, what they taught that is somehow closer to the events that this new documentation, which by the way, doesn't exist. So unless such a documentation should emerge uh, that is nearer to the events being described, we can't we, we can't know more than what we know from Hippolytus uh, and from Eusebius. All right. So Ananias then presumably is some sort of a church leader. He may well have been one of the 70 commissioned by Jesus. Or alternatively, he may have been an elder at the church in Damascus. Um, he might have even been the bishop of the church in Damascus, the, the senior leader. That's a, the, all of these are possibilities. But the point is, he's, he, I, when I preached on him, I often call him just some random schmo. But that's only because in scripture, we have no basis to describe who he was and what his function was. We just know that he lived there in Damascus. But the reality is he probably did have some sort of a function in the church. So um, similarly, uh, we see in the book of James, if anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and the prayer offered in faith uh, with the anointing of oil will heal the sick one and raise him up. So we see in that, that there is contemplated an eldership. There is clearly a leadership. So I would want to make the case that there is a priesthood of all believers, but in general, except maybe in cases of maybe persecution where the leadership are in hiding or have been killed or whatever, more often than not, um, people who are recognized as we could call them deacons, elders, and priests, uh, and, and bishops if we want, but we might just say church leaders. That's a little friendlier and, and broader spectrum. Usually these are the people who perform these rites, these rituals, these sacraments, uh, within church context. But the priesthood of all believers is still a, a reality. And here's why it matters. If you think about John Wimber's famous line, everyone gets to play, and we think about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are distributed, as Paul says, to each one, because the Spirit of God is in each one, then what we see is everybody can be involved in ministering and ministry, and there may well be times where somebody who's not strictly ordained maybe not even recognized as a church elder, but such a person might be, I don't know, engaging in missionary work somewhere or lead people to Christ. And in the moment, uh, there's no one around and the person is saying, as the Ethiopian eunuch did, here is water, why can't I be baptized? We might find ourselves now in a situation where, yeah, anybody could actually be doing the baptism. Or let's say a husband and wife want to celebrate uh, communion together with their children. Um, you could have a communion service in the home. You don't need to have Pastor Jones or, I don't know, Pastor whoever. I was going to throw in another name, but <laughs> Pastor Pemberton. There you you don't need to have Pastor Pemberton come around the house to administer communion. I think in a setting like that, it's, it's fine and appropriate for people to be doing this on their own. And in the meantime, they're engaging in good works of the ministry, this could be healing the sick, it could be driving out demons, it could be uh, bringing relief to the poor, and there's a lot of forms this could take, but they can certainly do all of that, and they don't need to be reverend so-and-so. And, -so. and the, the, thing that, the thing that's at the center of all this is what John Wimber used to call the hireling. 
because the way the church has developed over the centuries, I think in many churches, it remains true. John started, John was preaching about this in the 1970s and 80s. So, you know, we're 50 years on from there. But, um, but in that time frame, uh, John would say that many pastors are hirelings. They are hired by their church to administer sacraments, perform marriages and burials and funerals, uh, to perform baptisms, to preach the sermons, to administer the communion, uh, and to keep the church running and you know solve conflicts between church members and so forth. But but they don't. They're hirelings because they're beholden to the board or the eldership or whatever. They don't actually hear from God. They have no commission from God. Um, they're just people who are hired to fulfill a function. And in that sense, it becomes a form of religious outsourcing. So, you know, Grant, um, I have an accountant that takes care of much of the accounting for Orbis, not all of it, but but much of it. I hire them. They're they're an outsourced function. You probably do the same thing. You don't need to have a, an accountant on staff at your church. Um, some larger churches have that because they view it as important to have in house. But many churches outsource this function. Well, really, what we're doing is we're saying we're bringing the outsourced religious person in house, and we're they're going to be like a full time consultant. But where does that leave the people? Well, the people believe that they don't they can't. They'll, they'll never baptize anybody. They'll never serve communion. They'll never speak in tongues. They'll never heal the sick. They, they don't need to go out and minister to those who are in prison or visit the poor or those in convalescent homes or those in hospitals. They don't need to do any of that because that's what pastor does. And so we need to get away from this idea that everything is pastocentric, pastor centric. We need to move away from that to the idea that all of this ministry gets distributed to the body of Christ. And yes, the gifts of the spirit will flow through these people. And yes, there might even be legitimate times where uh, some people who are wise and mature and so forth are spiritual leaders without ordination. They might be baptizing people. They might be serving communion. They may be doing all of these things because we do believe that, that the priesthood of all believers means that everybody can do these things. There might be times when we don't want them to do them or where it's more appropriate for someone else to do them. But the point is they could and can, and there may well be times when they should. Now I'll pause here and give you a chance to respond to any of that that you might want to respond to. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we're talking about Ephesians four and um, you know, equipping the saints to do the work of ministry. Right. Uh, you know, and so I think, I think administering communion, sure. Um, also praying for the sick, also, um, you know, preaching the gospel and converting people and being evangelists and uh, all of that sort of thing. And so, yeah, I think certainly the move away from um, the pastor does the ministry into the church does the ministry. We all do the ministry. We have to. I think that's key. And I think really what you're talking about as well within this context is the that special anointed someone that can do the thing and we all have to go man and, of god right and so we all have to go and hear the, the latest revelation the hear uh the latest you know thing that's coming from this person um as opposed to the idea that well you know that he has the same holy spirit that i have and uh, i can learn to hear from the lord as well and while some people might be gifted in, in certain things for sure I think really what we're getting to is this, um, again, it's, you've said it already, but this everyone gets to play idea where everyone can hear from God. Uh, everyone can, can be in a, a relationship with God and everyone then can, can go and do the stuff, the word and the works of God, I think is where we're driving at. Well, there you go. So we're going to try to recover the priesthood of all believers. I'm not laying down all the ins and outs of it because as I've, as I've suggested and actually stated, um, I think there is still order in the church. And I think there is clearly roles for people to play. And some of these things might not commonly be done by everyone, but we do want to hold clearly the idea of the priesthood of all believers. The, by the way, the, this is rooted in scripture. The scripture says, we are a nation of kings and priests unto him. And even as far back as the Old Testament, 
in the book of Leviticus, God says, I have chosen you to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood of people for my pleasure from among the nations. Now, not everybody was a priest in old Israel. They had a priestly caste or class that, um, that carried out the temple ritual. That was reserved for the Levites and the priests to do all of that. Um, but yet God called them all priests unto him. So this is why I say there, there remains maybe a division of labor, but we don't want to create hirelings. And we also don't want to disempower the laity such that all they do is sit in pews, listen to sermons and throw their money in the offering plate. If we, if we come to that, we've definitely missed the mark. All right. Um, maybe at another time, we'll talk further about what it might look like and what would be some of the rules and parameters. All right. The seventh thing that uh, I wanted to talk about in this idea of um, of this Reformation, maybe we should call it the modern Reformation. That's not new Reformation. Maybe maybe that's a term. The modern Reformation. I like it. Uh, is a lack of political entanglements. Now, this is this is like the uh, what they call the third rail of American politics is the Social Security system. No one ever wants to talk about how we should reform it because so many people, it's their only retirement fund. And it was committed to by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt back in 19, I think it was 32 or three that the Social Security Administration came into being. Um, things have changed a lot in 90 years. And no one wants to deal with Social Security reform. And that's why it never gets addressed, gets kicked down the road all the time. But it's one of the things that's driving our country into insolvency. And it's it's going to need to be addressed eventually. And the longer we wait, the more painful it will be. Well, <clears throat> lack of political entanglements. So the first 300 years that the church existed, um, the church really didn't have any political power. I mean, I'm sure there were Christians in the palace. Um, we know that at times persecution died down and church buildings got built and Christians would gather for worship until the next persecution would arise. And then they would appeal to the emperor or the local magistrate who represented the emperor. But but none of this was the same as Christians holding power, uh, political power. And of course, once Constantine becomes a Christian, he's got all the power. He's the emperor. And I was reading an article um, very recently, actually, about something that I had not known. And so the fact that I didn't know it means not that others may not know it, but rather it's it's not a particularly well-known fact. But um, Constantine, even after he became a Christian, continued uh, for um, until his death to advocate for the old Roman gods and to endorse Roman religion. And in fact, uh, so Constantine's conversion is in 312. There were still emperors, Christian emperors, promoting pagan rituals and religion into the 400s. So if for at least 75 or 80 years, maybe maybe 100 years or more. And this was all based on a discovery that they made in Italy. And so what, what we see is an incredible conflict of interest that arises. Is the emperor really supporting the church or is the emperor supporting the pagan gods? Or is he just trying to get the people to like him and you know, basically vote for him. Now he's the emperor. He doesn't really need to stand for re-election. But, but you never want to be a ruler and not have your people basically going along with what you're doing because sooner or later there'll be a revolution or a putsch or something and you'll find yourself out of a job and quite possibly dead. So in the early church prior to Constantine, there wasn't really political power. In Israel of old, it's true that there was a, um, a theocracy such that the king was anointed and appointed. At least, at least David and Solomon were. But it's not as clear after that if they were all anointed and appointed. What ends up happening is people want to model the idea of a theocracy on what happens in, uh, in old Israel. But once Israel loses the monarchy and uh, Judah is sent into exile in Babylon 
And prior to that, the North Kingdom is sent into exile in Assyria. Once all of that occurs, for all practical purposes, the idea of a theocracy ceases to exist. Now, when there's a restoration uh, during the time of Zerubbabel, um, Zerubbabel is of the seed of David, and he is a secular ruler, but he's not a king. And what he is really is an administrator appointed by, in this case, the Persian government to oversee the restoration of the temple and to make sure that administratively this land called Israel, it functions well and that it doesn't uh, get into insurrection or rebellion against the, the emperor. That's really what they do. And what has happened in our time now, and, I, and I, I'm giving that for historical perspective, what's happened in our time now in the 21st century is there are people, and I have heard them say words just like what I'm saying now, there are people who are advocating for the idea that Christians should seize the reins of power, that we will legislate morality, that we will force there to be people to come to the table. It, it's almost like, you know, there'll be mandatory church attendance once again or something. And so I haven't heard anyone say that one, but 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 it goes so far that you could see where people might actually suspect this is on the agenda. It's just not being discussed. I don't think that's the way the Lord wants the kingdom of God to come. I don't think we can forcibly bring it down. I think Jesus will do that. Uh, he'll rule the nations with a rod of iron once he is seated on his throne in Jerusalem. But at the moment, that, that state of nature doesn't exist. And so when I hear people talk about how we have to um, we have to bring about change in the in the political sphere, I it's a it's a fine line to walk because we do want Christians in politics. We absolutely want Christians in politics with the idea that they will rule righteously. They will not do things that are unjust. They will not allow trafficking to go on. They will make sure that there are fair and just laws for dealing with everything from conflicts in the courts to, I don't know, labor practices. Absolutely, we want God's justice and mercy uh, to be seen through the walks of people uh, who fear the Lord and know his ways. They know his book. The idea that we're going to put in a theocracy where we're going to lay out, these are the rules, these are the laws, everyone has to obey them, or else, and you can fill in the blank with whatever follows the or else. The idea that we're going to do that, I think that is a very dangerous place to be. Yeah, and um, I think we've seen that again over and over and over again in history. And, um, you know, I think, again, the reason we're talking about this in what's going to be, um, you know, just a really fun, easygoing election year ah. is, is, uh, is we've seen this and it's honestly, it's not right or left. It's, it's both sides are being co-opted, uh, by parts of the church, I guess with the idea. And, and this is something that I've, and I've found interesting at one point in time, we all used to, to kind of assume that politician was, you know, not it's kind of a dirty word that you didn't want to be called that, but now they seem to be those that will save us. And uh, there we've put so much hope and faith and trust in our, in our political system. And the the church has certainly been co-opted on, on both sides of, of that, of the aisle into that. And so I do think, um, I think it's very important uh, for us as we're talking about this modern reformation to, to delineate and say, sure, of course, we, we want God-fearing people in all kinds of roles in society, but we don't assume that that's going to create the perfect scenario in which Jesus will be finally able to, to return now that we, we hold the powers of government, right? That's right. So coming off of the idea of the priesthood of all believers, which was our point six of the seven that we've covered in three weeks, we move to this idea of political entanglements I always have said, uh, just people act justly. Righteous people live righteously. Um, the scripture says the, the, uh, the just shall live by faith or the righteous shall live by his faith. So our faith guides us. It keeps us from making stupid decisions or worse, unethical or illegal or corrupt decisions. 
The scriptures are clear that the Lord abhors dishonest weights and measures. The Lord's not in favor of rulers who are uh, subject to bribes, uh, rulers who uh, prefer the rich to the poor, etc. The scriptures are rife with um, passages that speak of this. But if we're if we're Christian people, we shouldn't be able to be bought. I mean, it's really that simple. And with that, um, we need to we need to benchmark America, which has been uh, it's it's I I love being an American. I I think we're the greatest country in the world. Um, but we have to recognize that the American experiment has not even been going on for 250 years. And with that, uh, we can think back over the times of history, and we recognize that oftentimes believers have been like sheep before the slaughter. And this is in many cultures, many continents, uh, many eras of time. But let's talk about something really close to home. Let's think about the church in China, or the church in North Korea. Or the church that has to exist under a dimmy um, status, which is a, a, it's a legally sanctioned second class status where a very punitive tax is layered onto Christians or others who are not Muslims in Islamic societies with the idea that they will be permanently impoverished because they're giving away their money to the Islamic government. And of course, if they become Muslims, then they can just let all that go and they can simply keep their money and pay the normal tax. But this dimmy tax, uh, jizya is the name of the tax itself, and dimmy is the status that it reduces you to. So dimitude and jizya, think of all the believers through the centuries who have had to live under that. They did not have political power. Nobody was thinking they were going to seize control of the caliphate or the Politburo. And they were going to legislate and, you know, bring in the kingdom of God in that way. They're just hoping they survive and get home tonight and see their wife and kids and don't end up in a prison cell for 20 years being tortured. So I, I think we need to return to the idea that when we accept Jesus, you know, all bets are off except the, the final bet that when we die, we know we're going to heaven and we will see him. And with that, if there is going to be change in the political sphere, it's not because some Christian seizes the reins of power and crams it down everyone's throats. It's because we become adept at, I don't know, ruling justly and people can see that it's just. You know, the, the scripture says that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. And when the wicked rule, uh, the people hide themselves. So intrinsically, people sense justice and injustice. They sense right and wrong, whether or not we are wearing it on our sleeve. And with that, I think we we show a more excellent way um, and we rule from a position of righteousness and we affect righteousness, but we don't cram it down people's throats. But what that does tend to do is it builds a kind of consensus where people say, yes, this is what we want. This is what we're looking for. This is the nature of the society uh, we want to be in. And in that, um, the the end that we want occurs but it's not through coercion. It's because it's it's an, a public acclaim kind of event. It's, well, quite similar to democracy. The people say, we love this because this, this shows us something of God's fairness, God's justice, God's righteousness in all things. And, and let me just say this, because as I'm saying this, I'm hearing in my mind, uh, maybe people who are advocates for the LGBT movement. All of this that we are going to, lead by, it has to be consistent with the ways of God. So to try to put in a, a regime that legitimizes something that God says is not okay, it would be like legitimizing murder. That, you know, it would be analogous. It's not the same. I don't want anyone to think that I say that I'm saying homosexuals are murderers or anything like that. But it would be analogous to saying, okay, well, we're going to put in a regime that legitimizes murder. Well, no, we can't do that because the scripture says you cannot murder. And the scripture says you cannot commit adultery. And, you know, all of these alternate forms of sexuality, including heterosexual immorality, lest they appear to be bashing, um, all of these are alternate forms of immorality, of, of adultery. And so that one can't be legitimized. So there are certain guidelines. But beyond that, we're not trying to cram anything down people's throats. What we're trying to do is, is have the people of God see the justice of God, the righteousness of God lived out 
through people who are taken up with the idea of God, his glory, and his kingdom. And in all of that, everybody flourishes and prospers because that's the mind of God that he would give us the power to thrive, to get wealth, to live under and under our own vine and fig tree, um, to have our own horse and mule is the way they articulated it after the years of the Civil War. But the point is, we have the means of production under our own control. We have the right of self-determination. That's really where we want to go to, not that we're going to impose a theocracy. Sure. And I think it's important to say, you know, on the one hand, I don't think anyone would say, let's advocate for, you know, more persecution to befall us. You know, nobody wants that. We want to live in, in you know, as much as you can to live, uh, live peaceably, quiet right. lives. Uh, at the same time, there's this recognition that we're aliens in, in a foreign land and our king is not of this earth. And we're, we're citizens of, of something else entirely than what will be ruled and dictated, um, you know, here uh, on earth. And so I think it's holding those two things in, in some kind of attention of saying, sure, of course, we, you know, we certainly don't. We, we want to live as great a lives as we possibly can, um, you know, absolutely. But also recognizing that you know, we, we are aliens uh, in, in a foreign land. And and that's, I, I think, you know, I think it was last podcast, you, you mentioned something about you, the humility and simplicity uh, required in, in living out the Christian values and the way of life that Jesus talks about in a Sermon on the Mount. And, and so many of these, I think, can be boiled down to the idea of living simply, of being people of, of, of faith and people that uh, have, um, you know, humility that undergirds so much of what we do, meekness, all of those things. Um, I think that's what we're speaking to here. Um, if that makes if that makes sense of holding those things in tension. Yes, that's right. So again, I'm trying to paint the big picture. I'm not trying to flesh it out. <clears throat> and as I said. Um, in, earlier in this list of seven, uh, the devil is in the details. We've got to be sure we get this right, and we do it rightly and justly. Um, but but the concept is now in place. So these are seven things we're thinking about um, in the modern Reformation. I think I like that language, and we'll stick with that one. Heartfelt spirituality that is a, that is alive, uh, the foundation of the Bible, um, financial. Uh, I would say cleanliness and, and certainly no peddling um, the elimination of sexual excess in all of its forms um, consistent with uh, historic Christianity and Christian norms, uh, the priesthood of all believers uh, fully lived out. And finally, the lack of political entanglements. Every time the church gets involved in politics, it becomes corrupt and it's it's almost inevitable because then the church begins siding not so much with God, but rather with what's in its own best interests. And so we have to stay free of those entanglements. We need to vote as Christians. Absolutely. In a democracy, we need to do that. Many Christians don't have that right because they live in other countries where the political system is different. Um, so voting, no problem there. Holding office, no problem there, as long as we are not, again, seeking to think that, that will become the coming of the kingdom of God. Um, but we're simply bringing in the righteousness of God wherever we may uh, be engaged. Um, so that that really becomes the extent of our political involvement. Um, and with that, I think we've laid out seven uh, fairly important, um, not always easy to achieve uh, changes in the way we do church and if we can get there, I think the, the, the entire the entire complexion, the entire uh, understanding of the church will be changed in our days. And with that, um, maybe the church will no longer be a laughing stock. And when we speak, people will say, maybe we should be listening to what these guys have to say. They they get it right a lot. Maybe they have it right here, too. If we can get to that, I think we will have done well. And uh, I guess with that, Grant, we'll close out here and say we've covered our seven points. Maybe in a future time, we'll list a bunch more and try to catch up with Martin Luther. Yes. Yeah, maybe we will. Uh, no, I think this is great. And and I really appreciate you bringing us to this focus. Uh, and man, I, I, I think all of us are, are yearning for something like that 
uh, to return. And so maybe as priesthood of believers, we can all begin to enact these uh, core values and uh, become uh, the change that uh, we want to see to quote somebody else uh, yeah. as well. So yeah, Ken, thanks so much for taking time and for doing this. And uh, thank you all for listening uh, to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. If you are interested in exploring courses with us at Orbis School of Ministry, click on the link in the description of this podcast or go to orbissm.com. You can also send any school-related inquiries to our registrar, Joe McKay at joe at orbisministries.org. That's J-O at orbisministries.org.